everything has just started. Have day once more. Welcome. Uh, so we are still on track despite all the issues that we've had with um, COVID and working remotely, etc. So today we will talk about semantic change and we are actually a day ahead. You see, it was supposed to be on December the 1st, but it's actually November the 30th, uh, the last day of November. Uh, so next week, I will show you the grammatical change and you will get your second assignment that will be also, I hope, as interesting as the first one, slightly different, uh, but equally, let's say, creative. And then we will be wrapping up the course over two additional lectures. So today, we will talk about semantic change. But before that, a very brief review. Last week, we dealt with borrowing. And borrowing, as you heard there, is not actually uh, a one-off thing that is happening in Europe with English. It's a universal process. It always assumes a sort of bilingualism. And you always have a borrowing language that takes some linguistic features or items and adopts them to its system. And uh, the language that is being, you know, um, that is giving these features or items is called the donor language. In most cases that are usually discussed, the borrowings are lexical items, words, even interjections. But anything can be borrowed. Phonemes, phonological patterns, morphemes, grammatical constructions, pragmatic features. We discussed, I briefly mentioned it, but it was not in the slides the swear words in Norwegian, etc. So, uh, and this happens uh, generally for three reasons. Need, when you need something, and that's usually for lexical items. Prestige, this leads also to borrowings of pragmatic uh, constructions uh, and, uh, you know, even morphology. And negative evaluation, usually again for verbs, but some words, but usually can be also used for pronunciation. You sometimes, you know, mock people you dislike and you do it by uh, imitating their language. It's not common in Indo-European, let's say, languages, but in some other languages, the negative evaluation can actually uh, be based on borrowing of phonological features, how you pronounce something. So that brings us to the topic for today, a completely different background, right? Black, if your Windows, uh, Android, whatever you're watching, this has a black theme, this matches it very neatly. So uh, semantic change is the topic that uh, most people find most interesting in historical linguistics. It's actually a slightly misleading term um, because um, many, let's say, linguists, when you say the word semantics or semantic theory, Think about those logical relations among longer strings of words. But what is meant here by the term semantic change is actually the change of meaning of lexical items. So we are actually dealing with uh, lexical semantic change. So this is actually a more traditional approach this is the traditional classification also of semantic change and we will mention several let's say main types six and we will mention a couple of special cases so the six main types of semantic change are widening narrowing degeneration or pejorization elevation metaphor and metonymy so uh, I think that terms are re relatively self-explanatory. And when I mentioned that the lecture will be relatively short, it's because you already covered metaphor and metonymy in details uh, in some other courses. So there's no need to go um, again through it because you are experts on this. 
So let's focus on the things that maybe were not covered necessarily in those other courses. And that's uh, the first three or four of them, widening, narrowing, degeneration, and elevation. So widening uh, is sometimes also called extension, broadening. Uh, it's when the range of meanings of a particular word increases so that the word is used in a far bigger context, in more context than it was originally used for. The most famous example used throughout historical linguistics textbooks is from English, because English actually, I told you English is a unique language in terms of its history. No other language has undergone uh, so many changes and so radical changes as English. So uh, many, many examples are actually, um, many of the best examples are found in English. And here it is, the dog, uh, the animal that caused Joe Biden to slip and sprain his ankle. Uh, if you follow the news, Joe Biden had a dog accident. Uh, so dog was originally a very specific breed of a dog, which you see here. The one that we also in Serbian call uh, with the same, actually use the same word, doga, right? Uh, however, uh this word now so in middle english it was a special kind of dog dog in serbian now it includes any breed of a dog including let's say a chihuahua or this tiny fellow here uh so this is a wonderful example of this widening or broadening of the meaning another example uh is again from uh english but has to do something with latin as well it's the word salary so it comes from latin salarium and uh, it's uh, from the days when uh salt was very expensive very important important uh so it's uh, based on the latin word sal for salt and it was a soldier's allotment of salt. You know that salt prevents many diseases uh, thanks to the iodine, that, the iodine that it contains. And also uh, it makes the food taste better. So um, it was just the allotment of salt. But now it means, um, you know, uh, it, uh, it actually expanded its meaning to uh, denote a soldier's wages. So this is the first step in the semantic change. And then in modern English, it, may, it means not soldier's wages, but wages in general. So if you ever wondered why we say salary, it has to do with Roman times with the allotment of salt. And this is what I told you about in the introductory lecture on this course that especially when we talk about semantic change you will see the history of the world encoded in languages so it only makes sense salary uh, it only makes sense if you know the original meaning and what it was used for etc uh, there are some let's say less uh you know less mind-blowing examples such as let's say cupboard uh so cupboard um as the word itself implies if you ever thought about it is that it's a board it's a you know a plank uh, a piece of wood on which you put cups and other vessels so it's like a table fundamentally it was more like a shelf originally on which you put uh, cups. Then um, it developed, uh, you know, into the present day uh, meaning, but of course there are always intermediate steps. So it, uh, it uh, was, you know, uh, at one point 
uh, let's say a closet with shelves for keeping cups and dishes and now it's a small storage cabinet like the one you saw at the bottom of the screen or in canadian english it's even you know a wardrobe or a clothes closet so uh this also shows you that one and the same word can have different semantic development in different varieties or dialects of a particular language and you know that there are of course these kinds of differences uh, since this is historical linguistics we'll mention a couple of examples from other languages uh, so spanish caballero i guess that's the pronunciation but i don't know uh, was originally just a rider a horseman uh, now it's a gentleman man of upper society uh so that's another example of uh, let's say this broadening uh, of meaning but also this is tied to the other process which we mentioned and that's uh amelioration so when you make the meaning uh, let's say more favorable but sometimes it's difficult to decide what it is uh so finnish racha is another example it originally meant a fur bearing animal and it's pelt so something like this poor polar bear who was killed for this pelt uh now in finnish uh, due to its uh let's say um history um the f history of the finnish um uh, speakers speakers of the finnish language skins were an exchange medium uh for goods and services so um Raha at one point came to mean skin or pelt used as a medium of exchange. I give you some fur, then you give me, I don't know, uh, 10 sacks of potatoes. Uh, and when new means of exchange took place, uh, of course, when you stop trading with pelts only, uh, Raha. Uh, was still used, but it changed its meaning. And can you guess what it means today in Finnish? Anybody? A means in exchange of good and goods and services. Okay, uh, I will tell you, uh, it's money. So raha now means money. In Latin, the word passer is spero. So it was a specific kind of a bird shown here. They are mostly gone from big cities uh, for some weird reason. Uh, and in Spanish, it doesn't mean a sparrow. It's, I don't know how to pronounce it, but let's say pajaro, I guess. It's a bird in general. So that's the first set of examples that I showed you. So it's about a range of meanings of a word extending so that instead of being used in a single context for a single group of, let's say, things or beings, you extend the meaning so that it applies to multiple uh, contexts, more groups or the whole, you know, it becomes like... Uh, let's say, an overarching term for everything like this uh, pajero bird. The opposite of this is narrowing. So narrowing is not generalization, it's specialization. It's not extension, it's restriction. So there are, again, multiple terms, narrowing, specialization, restriction, but they all mean the same. The range of meaning is decreased so that the word can only appear in a smaller number of contexts than it could before the change so best examples again come from english and there's a word that we use every single day uh, that originally had a relatively different meaning a much wider meaning but now it narrowed so the word is meat originally meat meant everything that you see in this photo 
it was food in general uh and if you don't trust me and these lectures or uh campbell's book which i used to prepare these lectures you can see it for yourselves this uh, meaning of the word meat is still there in the king james translation of the bible which can be purchased to this very day so uh later since the times of uh king james translation of the bible it narrowed its meaning to food made of animals flesh uh, so it is a perfect example of narrowing and this narrowing is the only way that you can explain some let's say peculiar british expressions that currently make no sense for example uh, there are compounds used to this very day in the British house, like sweet meat, that actually mean candy. I mean, there's no sweet meat. Meat is meat. Uh, and there's a Swedish cognate word, mat, which means food. Now, you remember how dog was a specific breed of a dog, and then it was generalized. It extended its meaning to all dogs. Uh, of course, that doesn't mean that English speakers or the English language didn't have a word for a dog, a general dog before that. But this shows you the interaction of these semantic changes. So, you know, once word, one word extends its meaning, the system is balanced so that the other word, which was maybe used before, narrows its meaning so the original word for a dog in english is the anglo-saxon proto-germanic word for a dog which is in english hound in old english it was hund uh, so it was a dog in general those of you who maybe speak german know that to this very day in german a dog is ein hund uh, so it's you know this is the ori this is the word that hasn't really changed at all since early Germanic times in German it's still the same word which was used in old English but old English hund became a hound in Serbian that's hurt uh, so a very spe special breed of a dog that's usually used for its speed and agility in hunting uh that uh is not the only example of narrowing um so um wife originally meant a woman uh so it narrowed its meaning um so it uh narrowed its meaning over an intermediate let's say stage to a woman of humble rank especially one selling commodities of various sorts that's for example uh why you have old wives tales and fish wife as compounds and eventually uh it narrowed its meaning to a married woman a spouse uh so that's narrowing uh out of a woman in general married unmarried employed unemployed whatever you get a married woman uh, another example of this kind of narrowing is again from english uh, and it was again an old english uh, word uh deer so deer you know as this animal here reindeer uh but original english word was deor and it meant an animal uh this if you of course follow the germanic sound changes uh, especially the second consonant shift you know that this is tier in german this tier is the same word as deor in old english it's an animal in general however it narrowed its meaning to a particular animal a uh, similar destiny uh, is the destiny of the word fowl 
fowl uh, is of course edible or domestic bird, uh, but originally fowl was a bird of any kind, not necessarily edible and not necessarily domestic. Even sparrows and vultures were called fowl. And this again is uh, visible in the Old English where the word was fugo, which again, if you speak German, you know that uh, in German, the word for a bird is fogel, which is the same word as in Old English. And it's related to fowl, but originally, you see, it was a general word. Now it's narrowed to a specific kind of a bird. Uh, the weirdest, let's say, case of narrowing, again, comes from English. And you will be really surprised by this. Uh, the, world, the word which we, again, use almost every single day, not a word like fowl or or hound or something like that the word is a girl girl originally in middle english was a child or young person of either sex it could be a boy it could be a girl and for some reasons that are completely unexplained so for many instances of semantic change we really have no explanation we don't know why that happened so out of something that was possibly both a boy or a girl, we got a female child, a young woman. It's narrowing. Out of two possible sexes, you only get one. A uh, similar thing can be said for starve, which uh, originally uh, had a completely different meaning. Now, when you say starve, it means to suffer or perish from hunger. So starve to death, you die because you didn't eat. Originally, the word was teorvan, and it meant simply to die. Uh, that's actually the same word as in German, sterben, die. So again, if you know German, it helps a lot because you can see how old uh, English words actually got narrowed uh, and many people say that this happened uh, because of the influx of new words so this is a normal consequence of the phenomenon we dealt with earlier borrowing so if you have a lexical set that was there originally old english anglo-saxon lexicon and you start borrowing heavily uh, those words allow you that you borrow to express new nuances of meaning so this means that what you originally had as general terms suddenly have to specialize themselves and be used in a narrower set of context so many people say that semantic change when i said that there's no good explanation for it uh, there's usually no good explanation when you look at the word in isolation but when you look at the whole system of what is happening in the language uh, these semantic changes are usually the consequence of language contact and they are the consequence of borrowing because you have a new lexical item that's invading the territory of the let's say native lexical item so both have to give uh, and uh, another example now not from English is the French word soldat. Uh, soldat has nothing to do um, with, you know, we have it in Serbian, soldati, right, vojnici, but um, originally uh, it was, you know, uh, just to pay. It was any paid person which comes from soldier in the military so in french uh it's about paying but originally it was simply about paying for the services of a soldier like mercenary uh, uh, other examples from french uh is let's say i i'm scared to pronounce it you see it's 
you see it written here in red letters. Uh, the word origin, uh, the word means flag, but originally uh, it wasn't a flag. It was a piece of cloth fastened to staff. So it was derived from. Uh, again, I'm pro I'm scared to pronounce the word written in uh, blue, but uh, it was simply a cloth or a sheet that was then fastened to staff. Uh, and you have that uh, meaning, the original meaning uh, of the French word in English, which borrowed from French before the new meaning emerged. So the English word drape is borrowed from French, but in English it doesn't have anything to do with the flag. It has to do with the original French meaning of a cloth or a sheet. Uh, the similar thing happened to Spanish rezar, I guess, uh, which means to pray, but the original meaning was completely devoid of any religious connotations. Uh, so the old Spanish rezar simply means to recite, to say aloud. And you know this word because we have it also in Serbian. It's from Latin recitare, to recite, to say aloud. And we also have it in English in recite. Uh, so recitatia, recitiranje, etc. So you see how in this case, uh, it was probably not the borrowing which led to the change in meaning. In this particular case, it was actually the context that when you had to constantly say, uh, our father who are in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So you were completely constantly reciting these memorized sets of phrases that led to reciting, getting the meaning of praying. Because prayer is fundamental, usually, in most cases, about saying aloud or saying to yourself something that is pre-memorized. And with these two, uh, and with this example, we finish the first two groups of uh, semantic changes. As I told you, these were, uh, of course, and as you witness for yourselves, these are widening or and narrowing, or let's say generalization and specialization. You can call them different. You can use different terms, but fundamentally, it's about the meaning getting wider, widening, gen a more general generalization, or narrowing, or becoming very specialized. That's why narrowing is also called specialization. Now we will deal with a different set of semantic changes. So uh, these widening and narrowing, they are, let's say, general and they are not associated with any kind of, uh, let's say, emotional charge. Uh, the second group of semantic changes, degeneration and elevation, have, um, you know, a slight, um, let's say, a slight flavor of emotional charge added to them. So, this is the semantic change which uh, deals with uh, the word becoming uh, and the concept to which it refers becoming, uh, you know, um, negative in connotation or becoming more positive in connotation. So um, I will give you again some um, famous examples, and they again mostly come from English, you see. Uh, so that we'll start with degeneration or pejoration, uh, or some people say pejorization. Uh, so it's about uh, the word getting to be evaluated in a negative way. So it has uh, the word gets increasingly, uh, you know, judged as having negative connotations. Uh, so let's look at the English knave. Uh, so nowadays, if you, you know, asked uh, Google Assistant what it all was, define knave. Oh, not that nine. one, not, not that one. Um, 
Uh, yeah. You can hear it. Nave. Nave. Dishonest or unscrupulous man. Uh, that's the uh, current meaning of nave. But originally, it was knava in Old English. It was a youth, a child. Uh, so uh, here, uh, you know, uh, you can even, again, if you speak German, you can connect it to um, the German word knabe. Uh, you have some, you know, small sausages for um, um, children that are called in uh, German Knabernussi. Um, I don't know if you've been to Germany or Austria, but they are very popular there, especially when you're picnicking. Uh, so uh, Knabe is a boy. Uh, so uh, it originally was a youth or a child, uh, but then it developed into a servant, a rogue, or eventually what we have today, a very, uh, let's say, disreputable fellow. So a dishonest or an unscrupulous uh, man. Uh, what is really interesting and what is uh, very, you know, uh, well researched but still not fully explained topic in um, gender studies is that many terms for women uh, are actually examples of degeneration of uh, words getting a negative meaning some say that it could be used uh, as an example of how religion which portrays the woman as the instigator of the original scene you know eve tempted uh, adam to taste from the uh, to taste the forbidden fruit so many terms for women are examples of words which were originally neutral or not particularly negative which degenerated so that they are quite negative in connotation today uh, so let me show you some examples. So spinster uh, well, is now an unmarried older woman, and it usually has a negative connotation in the sense like, uh, you know, she didn't uh, manage to marry because she has some defect or something like that. Uh, many people have a negative connotation with this one. But originally, if you think about the word, it's obvious what it meant. It's the one who spins. It's a, you know, simply a woman who spins. Mistress uh, is a woman who rules or has control. But now, of course, we have the present day mistress. And uh, the most, let's say, famous example in this group is the word madam, which even to this day in a different spelling is a polite form of address to women but with a different spelling it becomes the female head of a prostitution uh, establishment uh, the examples are not only uh, to be found in english this degeneration and pejoration uh, can be visible in uh, words for women uh, in other languages, uh, the worst examples come from Italian and Spanish, which both have words puta, spelled differently with two T's or one T, uh, which, of course, uh, you can man imagine what they man mean. They mean whore. Uh, originally, they meant just a girl. Uh, so, um, and they were actually in... Uh, you know, in old Italian, uh, they were just, you need, no, really, this was the word for a girl. Uh, puta was a girl, puto was a boy, related to Latin putus and puta, boy, and a girl. A uh, similar thing happened to another word in Spanish, ramera, which is a prostitute, but it earlier uh, times, it was simply the innkeeper's wife a female innkeeper uh 
However, uh, negative connotation is not reserved to, you know, knaves. This is actually a term about a boy. Uh, terms for women, there are, you know, adjectives and other parts of speech that also underwent uh, pejoration. Uh, uh, probably the best example is the present day uh, adjective silly, which originally didn't mean foolish or stupid. It meant actually something very neutral, mostly positive. So Middle English Sally, spelled as S-E-L-Y, was happy, innocent. And Old English Sally, spelled with E, was blessed or blissful. Uh, and in German to this very day, you have this same adjective, Sally, which means blissful or happy. For this one, we really have no explanation. But uh, again, there could be some biblical explanation because, uh, you know, those that are, you know, happy and innocent, there is theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So we'll, there are open discussions on this. Uh, English, again, shows some, um, you know, pejorization examples that really give you insight into social relations and things that were happening in the english-speaking society so english word villain is a typical example of a word with a negative con connotation you know villain is very negative uh, yesterday we lost the actor who originally was um, the actor behind darth vader's mask so he died yesterday at the age of 85 and uh, if you watch the news uh, or uh, you know uh, traditional news like cnn bbc or social media news and similar outposts you heard that you know he depicted the most famous villain of the whole cinema history darth vader uh but villain uh originally had nothing to do with evil uh, if you think about the root of the word villain it sounds somehow that it has something to do with villa uh, and um, actually it does but uh, the line in french is a person a serf a farm worker somebody who simply is you know somewhere in the village working in the village uh, the word village is actually related to this one uh, and then in middle english uh, because of the issues that aristocracy had with people working at farms uh, it came to mean something like a low-born base-minded rustic ignorable man with very um, very weird ideas and instincts and today it's you know an unprincipled scoundrel a criminal uh so that's a you know probably the best example of negative evaluation or pejoration whatever you want to call it uh so something very neutral becoming very negative uh if you go outside English, Spanish, siniestro, I guess, siniestro, means sinister. But in all the English, it was simply left, from Latin, left. For some reason, obviously, they thought that being on the left is somehow sinister. Uh, English disease or illness was not originally an illness. It was simply a form of discomfort. It was a term for discomfort. But uh, as you can see, uh, words can become negative, but there is the opposite process where the word can get a more positive uh, judgment or po more positive, in more increasingly positive value judgment. So the users of the language over generation shift the sense of the word which was originally either positive or neutral let's say neutral 
or negative and make it more positive or if it was positive it becomes more positive uh, one of the best examples again is uh, from english and it's the word pretty like in pretty woman originally it had nothing to do with beauty it was actually something that you would use for black adder pretty or in old english was crafty or sly some people try to explain it that uh, crafty sly people usually are good looking people so you know they also you know they trick you with their beauty and their uh, craftiness uh, then another uh, you know uh, adjective uh, or let's say uh, past participle when you say that you're fond of something it means that you like it for example uh, here uh, uh, obviously these uh, these two are very um, very fond of cakes or sweets uh, but in the old English the past participle fonen was meant to be foolish or silly however the very best example comes again from English and we briefly discussed it when we were dealing with uh, old English uh, phonological changes and that's the word night in old English the word was spelled with a C uh, so but it was pronounced as knicht uh, and it was a boy or a servant in service of a lord it was fundamentally a servant uh, we have the same word in english in this origin uh, we have the same word in serbian in this original sense it's a kmet kmet is fundamentally a knight uh, then over the course of history so this servant in uh you know uh, in the service of a lord became uh, not just a small boy servant it became a servant in general then uh, as times changed and it was important to quash rebellions it became a military servant a warrior in service of the king and then uh, in uh, early modern english it became uh, a mounted warrior again serving the king so that finally today we have a member of the lesser nobility uh, with the title sir that's uh, bestowed upon people by the king or queen of england as you can see in the photo on the right hand side where the queen is knighting somebody i don't know who that is uh, i think it's kenneth brana yes it's sir kenneth brana being knighted by the queen for his contributions to the art of england uh, good choice i guess uh so it's that's actually the best example that you can find on amelioration or positive evaluation as a semantic change uh when you go outside english and you look for example as we looked in other uh groups of semantic changes to uh let's say spanish or latin latin cabalus was a neg a workhorse like coin in finnish which has a negative connotation but in spanish it has a completely neutral or even positive meaning it's simply a horse cabal is a horse uh latin cale 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 i guess uh, is a cattle path it's a small path used by you know uh flocks of animals and their um shepherds uh but in spanish it came to mean a street uh a similar thing happened with spanish casa a house me casa tu casa right uh, it's about a house in latin casa was not a house it was a hut or a cottage and these uh, are let's say some of the examples of uh, 
amelioration or uh, positive evaluation from world's languages. Now, I will not go into details uh, regarding metaphor and metonymy. I will just show you some slides so that we can skip to practice uh, section. Uh, but you know from other courses that metaphor is a semantic change that involves extension in the meaning of a word or a phrase that suggests a semantic similarity or connection between the new sense and the original sense. So uh, English bead uh, is a metaphoric extension of, from Old English bed or bell, the prayer, uh, Middle English bed, the prayer bead, rosary bead, and nowadays you have modern English beads also used for decorative uh, per, uh, de decorative purposes. So the semantic shift through the metaphoric extension from the prayer, which was kept track of by the rosary bead, uh, includes even you know completely new uh, meanings like beads of water. Uh, right. So here you have decorative beads, but also beads of water these days. So that's a perfect example of metaphoric extension. There are many other examples from uh, French and Spanish with leaves of plants becoming leaves of paper, etc., or uh, or Latin perna ham, which came to mean a whole lag and some other uh, examples. Sorry, just a second. I have to blow my nose. Sorry. Okay, sorry, um, I have some issues with my nose. Uh, so you know examples of metaphor and you dealt with uh, metaphor in some other courses. Uh, they are also used in some, you know, very, um, uh, let's say, uh, sexual uh, connotations like English stud uh, is a metaphor from a male animal used for breeding exemplified here by the original stud and young Brad Pitt. Uh, and uh, that brings us to the last one that you again know, uh, that's metonymy. And it's a change in the meaning of a word so that it comes to include additional senses which are not originally present, but which are closely associated with the word's original meaning. The examples that um, Campbell gives in his book are um, Spanish cadera, uh, meaning hip, uh, but coming from Latin cathedra, which is actually just an armchair. So uh, this, I guess, is a really good metonymy. That's you know, uh, you know, where you put your buttocks <laughs> comes to mean buttocks. Uh, there are uh, some famous examples of, let's say, um, Champagne. Uh, Champagne is just a region in France, in France, but uh, it's you know now uh, they say Champagne for the characteristic product from that region, which is of course the bubbly wine. Uh, so Champagne originally is just the region of France. Uh, there are also some subtypes of metonymy that I'm pretty sure you discussed with uh, uh, your professors in other courses that dealt with this. Uh, the most famous one is synecdoche. Uh, synecdoche, probably long pronunciation at the end. It's a subtype of metonymy and it's a part to whole relationship. Uh, so it's a term with more comprehensive meaning, which is used to refer to less comprehensive meaning or vice versa. A part or a quality is used to refer to the whole, or the whole is used to refer to the part. So it can go in both directions. So 
in english that's the reason why hand can mean a hired hand an employed worker in many languages this is the reason why sun means day this is also the reason why in many languages tongue means language that's the reason why in most languages moon means a month uh, that's all synecdoche uh, and this is the reason why in a german bein which is leg originally meant uh, bone uh, and that's it that's it uh, so that's the whole classification of semantic changes uh, with the focus on widening narrowing degeneration and elevation whereas metaphor and metonymy were covered in you know, other courses especially those uh, that um, you got with professor Prčić. so now we will do uh, some exercises on semantic change and uh, we may finish uh, by 10 30 i guess so these uh, these are exercises again from campbell's book uh, from the section on semantic change and uh, here your task is to identify the semantic change of, uh, that is visible in the following examples i simplify this because uh, in the book, you get the words themselves, but I uh, actually um, took the words from, uh, let's say, from the, one of the dictionaries that I have at my disposal and added some photos so that you see the current meaning and then uh, you also see the old meaning. So, uh, I'll. Uh, was originally a passage between the pews of a church now uh this is what it used to mean now it means a passage between rows of seats as you can see here so what kind of semantic change is responsible for a passage between the pews of a church becoming passage between rows of seats as exemplified in these photos so is it narrowing is it widening is it specialization uh, so not is it narrowing or widening is it uh, amelioration or pejorization sorry uh sorry you were distorted but i think i heard something like widening uh so maybe we have some uh broad um, let's say uh internet issues uh my daughter is also in a class because they stopped in-person teaching and she has classes in mathematics but yes it's widening uh now let's look at bereaved bereaved the word bereaved originally in the old days earlier times uh, from the history of english meant robbed like in this cartoon uh, however as you know today it doesn't mean robbed it means deprived by death so out of being robbed in general you get robbed of your loved ones by death so it's anybody narrowing narrowing yes it's a very weird case of narrowing so you are not deprived of your personal belongings in general by i don't know uh, thieves you are deprived or robbed of the loved one by death so it's narrowing another great example is a butler uh, so the word butler used to mean and you'll be surprised to hear this but nothing of the kind that you know meaning you have in batman the dark knight uh, it was a male servant in charge of the wine cellar 
So you see, it's a photo from Downtown Abbey. Uh, but this character, if you watch Downtown Abbey, um, he was not really in charge of the wine cell. But let's imagine that you haven't seen Downtown Abbey. So a servant in charge of the wine cellar. Now it means a male servant in the household, generally. Oh, yeah. So what would be the, the semantic change? <laughs> Is it um, amelioration? Amelioration, aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, but did it really have a negative meaning? Not really. For amelioration, you need to have something that was either neutral or negative becoming positive. This was not negative. So I, uh, in this case, you're actually dealing with widening. So instead of being in charge of a wine cellar, you are in charge of everything in the household, uh, including the kitchen, the bookshelves, uh, everything. Or, you know, in case of Batman, also the secret laboratory. So that's uh, widening. Uh, chap, uh, originally in English, and it's not used really in American, you hear English really means England, it was a customer the meaning shifted from a customer to a fellow you know like shown here a fellow a good old fellow so what would it mean uh from the semantic point of view so you have a customer a special group of you know people you are associated with who pay you for your services to you know, a person you know generally that you don't pay. It's weird, but we think it's actually widening. Uh, sometimes, as you can see here, uh, you have to choose the option which is, um, let's say, uh, the closest to what happened. But sometimes uh, these semantic uh, changes are really really difficult to even classify because the this the let's say the meaning of customer and the fellow are really only marginally uh, related uh, this to today uh, another good example and this one is a good example not like chap uh, is the word coast coast earlier meant a side a side of anything a side of a two-dimensional object a side of a four-dimensional object and today of course side means the seashore uh, as you can see in this photo of the beautiful wonderful coast of cornwall where hopefully we can you know one day visit when there's no corona and make some likable instagram photos from there uh, theoretically even buy a house there it would be a nice place with a nice view so what is the change that uh transforms a side into a seashore so it's a side of anything now it's a side of the island the side of the continent Narrowing. Narrowing, yes. The semantic change is narrowing because out of a general word for the side of any object, two-dimensional, four-dimensional, you get the side of the island or a continent. Another example uh, for semantic change that is relatively okay is the word frock. Frock originally meant something like this a loose fitting outer garment especially used by aristocracy and soldiers but then the meaning as you are probably well aware these days if you follow um, fashion trends frock these days means something like a woman's dress as exemplified in the other photo uh, so 
what what do you think what kind of so a loose fitting outer garment especially for soldiers but also in general and now it's a woman's dress it's not negative or positive because a woman's dress and a looser fitting outer garment are probably from this perspective also they are neutral terms there's nothing you know emotionally charged about them so it's simply a question of whether it's widening or narrowing and this is then probably also narrowing narrowing uh -huh, narrowing some of you know uh, not some of virtually all words <laughs> uh, virtually all nouns from the top 500 nouns in english according to some research studies uh, underwent some sort of semantic change uh, a good example is also a ghost ghost originally was not a ghost something that haunts buildings originally a ghost was the soul spirit that's why in prayers and in the church you say the son the father the son and the holy ghost it's uh, you know it has nothing to do with the meaning of a soul of a dead man manifested to the living haunting houses and wreaking havoc in uh, abandoned buildings so uh this is of course let's not talk about the original uh you know religious term let's think about this term so it was a soul or spirit in general living or dead uh now it's a soul of a dead man as it manifests to the living again right i know it's becoming repetitive but it's narrowing uh ordeal is another example uh, of semantic change presented by campbell or uh, earlier the ordeal was a legal trial by a physical test it was terrible shown here uh from india but it was used in europe it was a terrible thing you know that in middle medieval times legal tribal physical test was for example whether the woman charged of being a witch will you know sink when you put some stones around her neck uh, and of course every woman would sink when you put some uh, stones around her neck so they were all witches uh, or you were you know uh, or uh, there was an ordeal by fire as you see here and uh, now as you well know this has nothing to do with uh you know you proving through physical test that you're not a witch or that you're not possessed by a demon ordeal is simply a difficult experience what you see uh on your right hand on the right hand side of, side of your screen is uh the second hit for the word ordeal <laughs> on google photos at least for me uh, so this is what kind of a semantic change so elevation could be elevation but uh bear in mind widening, also, widening yeah let me explain i was also in doubt about that but as you know i have insight into the book and the explanation provided here the explanation is that strictly speaking it could be amelioration but it's widening because ordeal originally was not perceived as negative ordeal was something that people enjoyed people were coming to see whether the you know the woman charged of being a witch would burn or she would stay alive after being burnt because she was not possessed and was protected by the holy ghost so it was a uh, let's say neutral or even a positive word that then widened its meaning to any sort of trouble or difficult experience that you have to endure so uh, that's why it's widening had it had negative connotation then this would be amelioration but 
we always forget uh, or we tend to forget. I also forgot it when I was preparing for this class initially that, and I also put uh, amelioration that as Campbell puts it in his book, this word was actually probably very positive or at least neutral for the original speakers in those days. Uh, now, the word which we use every single day, every single hour, the word thing, the beautiful word thing, had nothing to do with the thing originally. The thing originally meant a legal matter. And the word thing today is, if you think about it, any matter, including the artistic, um, let's say, vision of black matter uh, in the space. Or if you watch, um, what's the name of that TV series? Uh, His Dark Materials, yes. You know, if you watched uh, the series or if you read the book, uh the whole point of lyra's quest is to find the dust but dust turns out to be dark matter that interconnects everything in uh our multiverse so legal matter any matter what's the change widening again widening, yes you cannot get any wider than that it's actually uh, this word, if you read Campbell's book, he has many, many examples for every uh, kind of these changes that I outlined here. So what you saw in the slides before the practice, this, this was like the tip of the iceberg. The book contains many, many other examples. And he actually uh, talks about this example in particular. This is one of the best examples of widening. Uh, of course, dog is also a great example of widening, but this is bigger in a, in a way. Wretch, the word wretch originally meant uh, exile. Uh, so um, exile, uh, like the original exiles from uh, the Garden of Eden, Presumably, exiled people were not very happy with the state of affairs, especially Adam and Eve when they were exiled. So the meaning of a uh, wretch as an exile shifted to an unhappy person because just think about free food, free, you know, free uh, botanical garden, everything, you know, at your disposal in the Garden of Eden. And now, you have to cultivate your own gardens, hunt animals, etc. No wonder that it's switched to an unhappy person. So, but what would be the change here? So, you had something like a general term, neutral term, that now means something quite negative, unhappy person. Here, we do have some emotional charge attached to this. Degradation. Uh huh. Yes, or you can call it pejoration or negative evaluation. There are many possible terms that you can use. Uh, and for example, I didn't mention it, but in the written exam, what you can get as a question is provide two examples. No, uh, what you usually get is something like uh, what uh, is semantic change provide two examples of uh, widening and narrowing. For ex That could be like a question. Or uh, what is semantic change? Provide two examples of uh, amelioration and pejoration. Uh, and for this, of course, you, you, have, you can use the slides. And this exercise provides additional examples. The word dizzy earlier originally meant foolish, uh, like in this, um, you know, like in this photo, that was not the first hit, uh, I have to admit, but really, you know, this, this looks very foolish. Uh, and uh, today, uh, of course, uh, as you know, the word dizzy uh, is a completely 
different word. Uh, and if you have to paraphrase it, you would say that it means vertiginous or vertiginous, depending on your variety of English, which is, you know, affected by vertigo, dizzy. So out of something that meant foolish, you get somebody who is simply affected by vertigo. What would that be? That's actually amelioration because of a, out of a negative meaning that you're stupid, you have a nice meaning that you're not stupid. You're actually maybe just, you know, affected by vertigo or, you know, you're dizzy because your blood pressure is low or something like that. So this is, so you're not saying that you're inherently stupid. You're just currently intellectually incapacitated. So that's why uh, we would say this uh, is an example of amelioration. The adjective fair originally used to refer to somebody, to describe somebody who's beautiful and pleasant. Uh, like, I think this is Grace Kelly, uh, whose son visited Serbia during the pandemic, Prince of Monaco, and he visited a farm near Sombor where he had to go through some muddy patches of land to get good food, but that's his mother. Uh, so th th this meaning of fair is the reason why one of the classics of a uh, film is called My Fair Lady. My Fair Lady means uh, my beautiful lady. Uh, however, now fair is no longer beautiful and pleasant. Uh, Tanya was in charge of choosing this photo. We prepared these slides together a couple of years ago. Maybe it's not appropriate, but, you know, Tanya said it was. Uh, so this now means moderate or tolerable. Uh, so the reason why nobody today would refer to Grace Kelly as fair is what semantic change. Okay, I guess you're tired. Pejoration. That's pejoration. Uh, some other examples of semantic change include fame. The word fame, but you will, you know, you would hardly guess it, but once fame meant a report, a rumor. Today, of course, fame refers to the status of being a celebrity. Uh, you know, fame is associated with renowned people. So this is the property of celebrities and renowned people. So what is, you know, the word, the semantic change that made Madonna become famous? Uh, the process, of course, is amelioration because the neutral report or rumor became you know uh, the fact that everybody talks to you in a positive way uh, wave so uh, way sorry fame is fundamentally if you're not a famous person i guess and you don't have to you know endure the trouble of you know thousands of messages every day it's considered a positive thing, so it's amelioration. Uh, also in Campbell's book, there's the word glamour. There's a whole paragraph that describes uh, the change that affected the word gla glamour. Uh, so, uh, but instead of telling you to go to a particular page and read a lengthy, almost a page long paragraph, uh, very briefly, glamour originally, if you look it up in the Oxford English Dictionary, meant spell or enchantment. But now the word glamour shifted 
uh, to concepts such as attractiveness or allure. So the word glamour from, you know, something that riches would do to you, uh, shifted to something that is attractive and, uh, you know, desirable, uh, very alluring. So that's amelioration. The similar, um, let's say, semantic change, but not entirely identical, is the word luxury. Somewhat surprisingly, I guess, the word luxury originally, once, a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, meant lust, uh, as exemplified here in a picture from True Blood. Uh, and uh, today, luxury uh, means sumptuousness. So uh, that's again the semantic change of amelioration. Uh, however, uh, you know, Campbell, as I mentioned, provided a long list of words that you should analyze, but don't worry, uh, in this exercise, we have only uh, four, no. Yeah, four more words. Minister, mischievous, um, notorious, and that's it, actually. So uh, let's look at them. A minister was originally a servant. Uh, that's why, you know, in churches you have ministries. These are actually priests in the service of the um, pa patriarch, let's say, or uh, the bishop or whatever. Now, the minister uh, is not a servant of God or the church, is a, it's a government official. Uh, so this change from a servant, uh, let's say from an unprivileged to a very privileged position, is the change of amelioration, of course. Mischievous or some people pronounce it as mischievous, but I guess more the correct one is mischievous, is originally uh, an adjective that meant disastrous. Uh, nowadays, mischievous is defined as playfully annoying. Uh, so this change, of course, from your village burning down to somebody just, you know, pranking you and then you having fun together after the prank is amelioration. And uh, the last ex word from uh, Campbell's exercise is notorious. Uh, notorious originally was about being widely known. So you can have, you can find some old letters where Shakespeare is described as notorious. Uh, but, you know, without knowing the semantic change, you would think that Shakespeare was some kind of, you know, scandal master. No, Shakespeare was simply widely known. Uh, today, however, uh, notorious no longer means widely known. It means widely known in a very unfavorable way. So notorious uh, got a very, very uh negative meaning so we're at pejoration. This, yes this is a perfect example of pejoration so if you want to remember this example that's a very good example uh, especially because there is historic uh you know evidence which shows you that shakespeare was originally labeled as notorious uh, that's, I guess, people that were widely known uh, back then, if you want to find explanation, people that were widely known were probably widely known for, let's say, not particularly good reasons most of the time. So that's why it changed its uh, meaning to a pejorative meaning of unfavorably known. That's pejoration. Now, uh, I promised you a relatively uh, shorter uh, class, uh, but uh, 
I have some uh, an exercise, uh, the second exercise of semantic change from Campbell. Uh, and it's actually relatively monotonous. I will show you why, and then uh, we can slowly wrap this up. Uh, it's relatively monotonous because uh, it's only about widening and narrowing. So unlike the first exercise where we had uh, widening, narrowing, amelioration, and pejoration, here, it's only widening and narrowing. So these examples are very good. But the problem is, I will show you the problem. Uh, describe how the meaning widens or narrows in the following examples. And then Campbell gives you uh, 16 or 20 words uh, to uh, analyze. Uh, so let's look at, let's say, the first one from his set. Um, why uh so why uh did this meaning change addict uh, was someone who devotes himself to anything today it's a person who devotes himself to drugs somebody who's addicted to drugs so uh what would be the is it narrowing or is it widening narrowing narrowing uh, then uh, the second example is argue, uh, originally to make clear, to give uh, reasons for or against something to make clear using angry words. That's the present day meaning. So this is again. Narrowing. Narrowing. Yes. So the problem with this exercise is that he organized the exercise so that all the first words are narrowing and all the second half of the exercise is widening. So now I will show you all these examples of narrowing and then I will show you the examples of widening. Uh, so that's why it's so um, so uh, monotonous as an exercise. Another example of narrowing is to arrest. Uh, arrest was originally to stop. Now it's to use the power of law to take or keep someone uh, such as a criminal uh, and to stop the progress of his criminal activities. So it's narrowing out of a general stop to stop criminals from, uh, you know, repeating their offense, offenses. Accident was originally an event, an event, any event. Now it's a sudden event that is not planned or intended. Originally it was a planned or unplanned event, any event. So obviously it's narrowing. Censure uh, was uh, originally uh, to judge generally to judge in a very neutral way now it's to judge in a negative way with criticism involving condemnation it could be also pejorization or pejoration as some people also call it or negative evaluation but since a censure is not necessarily ne it's a negative thing for the person who's maybe being censured but uh, from the point of view of society, criticizing somebody and condemning bad behavior is not a bad thing. So we treat it as narrowing. Uh, erotic is another example of narrowing. It was generally anything related to love. Uh, now it's not related to love, it's related to sex. Uh, fortune originally, uh, was chance. Uh, fortune was really just a chance. Now, fortune, uh, you know, when you say that somebody inherited a fortune, uh, it's prosperity attained through luck. So this is narrowing. So this is a chance that somebody, um, that somebody really just, uh, has to inherit a lot of money or win a lot of money at a lottery. Molest was originally uh, to trouble or annoy. Very, let's say, generic. Uh, now, 
molest has a terrible meaning to harm someone through sexual contact or to touch someone in a sexually improper way so uh, this is narrowing uh, again orgy similarly was an uh, is now the result of narrowing don't blame me for the examples they are weird but they are campbell's examples uh, orgy was originally any instance of secret observances so uh, when secret societies met it was called an orgy now it's a wild party with many people having sex together so this is again narrowing it's still a secret observance but of a particular kind order was any sense any percept anything perceptible to the sense of smell so it was a miris in serbian any miris now it's a particular smell uh, and not any particular smell, but an unpleasant smell. So it's a narrowing. Again, could be pejorization or pejoration, but because the original meaning was neutral and now order is, um, it has a negative meaning, but it doesn't necessarily have a negative connotation. You know, something simply smells. Uh, so it's not that, you know, you're judging somebody. Uh, that's why we treat this as narrowing. And narrowing is also the success. Success was any outcome originally. Now it's an outcome which is the right one, the desired outcome. And of course, we all want to succeed. That's why the desired outcome is success. So it's narrowing. Uh, retaliate was originally to repay for anything. Here you have an example of a young boy burning something in Northern Ireland, I think. So uh, retaliate now means to get revenge against someone, to repay uh, in kind and with interest in a way, uh, to you know do something bad to someone who has hurt you so it's again narrowing and seduce is also narrowing because it was originally uh used in the sense of persuade someone to persuade someone to desert his or her duty now it's about persuading somebody uh by means of physical seduction and to entice that person to a sexual intercourse so out of general persuasion about desertion of duty now it's about uh you know specialized meaning so narrowing now after this set everything else that follows is widening uh so allude was originally to mock now it means to make indirect reference of any kind so here you have Eminem showing horns alluding to the devil. So that's the new meaning of allude. So it's widening. It's not mocking. It's making indirect reference of any kind. Ant or aunt, depending on your variety of English, uh, was a father's sister originally. Now it's either mother's or father's sister. So it's a perfect example of widening another perfect example of widening is carry carry uh originally contains in itself uh, the root of the word cart so it was to transport by cart uh however now it is widened to moving something while holding or supporting it or uh you know yeah moving something generally while supporting it or holding it so widening uh, the test is also widening originally it was to condemn or to curse now it's to dislike very strongly um, elope was uh, to run away from someone's husband very specific meaning 
now it's to slip away to escape which is relatively rare but uh actually um divide the meaning wide and even in this sense of running away from someone's husband as you know from this movie it's about running away from parents to get married or do something that parents forbid you to do uh, a fact was a thing done now it's something that truly exists uh, something that has actual existence so it's again widening and the widening is also gang a group of workmen or slaves now it's actually a group of people who are friends and who do things together so uh, this new meaning uh, of a group of people uh, who are your friends is actually widening but could also be amelioration even campbell himself mentions in the book that it's generally widening because it's a group of criminals but now it's a group of people who are friendly and a general group of people even those that you do not know in america when you enter a room of course now you cannot do that because of social distances but you can you can say ha ah, you're the gang right uh in the sense like you are the group of friends uh so that's why it would be widening and widening is also harvest so it was reap to reap ripened grain now it's uh, the amount of crops that are uh, gathered and to uh, you know collect crops uh, that are gathered so both meanings are still there but the new ones uh, are actually the meanings that got widened so the season when crops are gathered the amount of crops uh, that are gathered uh, in a single season and i have only four more and this would be the end of these examples mess is widened because out of a meaning of a meal set out for a group of four you have now a very dirty or untidy state of condition so obviously a meal set out for a group of four usually ended up being a messy affair so the meaning widened to everything that is messy and uh, untidy mystery was divine knowledge that was revealed to somebody who is you know very religious now it's something that is beyond understanding of everybody something not understood uh, and that's why campbell treats it as widening start was to move suddenly so, so to start a movement of your body in a very sudden fashion now it's to begin anything not just your body movements but to begin work uh, or anything else so that's a good example of widening and the last two scent was an animal order for tracking in hunting now it's also it's widening but also amelioration it's a pleasant smell that is produced by something so it's not just uh, an animal smell that hun that ha hounds could use to track down the animal now it's any smell that um that is pleasant in those days when scent was a uh, animal order for tracking it was not negative that's why it's more best to describe this as widening because scent was neutral as a term and finally slogan was a battle cry of scottish clans now it's widened to a word or a phrase that is easy to remember and is used by a group like the Scottish clan or business to attract attention. Uh, so it's widened and the best slogan is, for example, think different. And sorry, 10 minutes over time, but uh, we just finished uh, semantic change. Uh, as I mentioned, the question that you can get on semantic change is something like, um, 
what is semantic change, provide two examples of widening and narrowing. And then you would say semantic change is actually uh, a change in the meaning of individual lexical items. That's the answer. You already have three points. There's nothing else. And then you give some examples of widening. That would be the dog, for example, which was dog originally, celery, which was originally the allotment of salt. And for uh, narrowing, you can give an example of, let's say, a hound, the opposite of a dog. So hound was a dog. Now it's a special breed. Or uh, let's say deer, which was originally any animal and now it's just a particular type of an animal and that's it 10 points but the other possibility is what is semantic change give two examples of uh let's say um degeneration and amelioration then for degeneration you could use the knave so youth or um a servant becoming, you know, uh, the, having the meaning of, this, uh, of you know, um, a thug uh, or this this disreputable fellow, or um, some of the words which I also gave you there, uh, like uh, let's say, madam, mistress, or silly. And for evaluation, you can uh, use pretty or night. Night is the best of them all. Or if you like Spanish for, uh, for amelioration or elevation or positive evaluation, you can also give casa, uh, which was a hut originally. Now it's a house. Or cale, uh, which was Latin path. And now it's a street in Spanish. So, uh, any uh, questions, comments, etc. I will stop the recording session now. Um, uh -huh. Wait, no, where do I stop the recording? Uh, no, it doesn't work. Aha, here it is. It's.